Okay, so polymers are often added to nanoparticle suspensions in order to prevent them from flocculating or coagulating. In fact, there are biocolloidal suspensions that also use polymer-mediated forces. And polymer-mediated forces add to the, uh, the electric double layer force to counteract the attractive effects of van der Waals forces. So, um, so polymers in, in the solution give you, um, give you, when they attach the surfaces, give you this additional colloidal stability. <coughs> so how many of you have taken uh, a class in polymer science before? Okay, a f okay, a, a good number of people. Um, the beginning of this class uh, will be boring, uh, but I'll go through it quickly. I just want to tell you about what a polymer is, a little bit how we make them before we start attaching them to surfaces, just so we can get everybody on the same page. Now, as, as different as the origin of polymer-mediated forces are from uh, electric double layer forces, they actually operate in a similar way. So we have these polymer chains that, are, that flop around and as you get two surfaces closer to each other, the entropic freedom of the polymer chains becomes reduced uh, because of this constriction in, in volume and therefore the, the surfaces get pushed uh, farther apart due to this entropic effect. It's actually very similar to the, this halo of counter ions that we had in the electric double layer force that when compressed also causes the, uh, also causes the uh, a, a repulsive force between surfaces as they're brought closer uh, together. Polymer mediated uh, forces. Polymers are named after the monomer. Regardless of the polymerization technique, so we usually draw the repeat unit of, say, polyethylene like this. With an, with an N here, which indicates the uh, degree of polymerization, the number of times this thing repeats. And it is uh, derived from ethylene. And you can envision this as one of these bonds forms a bond with the next unit, and with the next unit, with the next unit, like dominoes. And another uh, famous polymer that we have, this is polyethylene oxide. PEO, polyethylene is often just called PE, as in the recycling triangle on the bottom of a milk jug, which would be high density polyethylene, HDPE. And this is derived from um, this molecule, which is uh, um, ethylene oxide. which is the simplest uh, epoxy functional group. Polyethylene oxide is not considered an epoxy polymer, um, but this functional group, this three-membered ring with an ox uh, oxygen atom is called an epoxide. Okay, how about polymers in nanoengineering? Nano and chem. engineering. One uh, super famous one is this, which is polydimethylsiloxane. Uh, 
or PDMS, which is also known as silicone rubber. I didn't really need to draw this extra oxygen atom over here, but it's, it's not wrong. Just, just consider this bit. This is used in, for example, soft lithography. Um, bioelectronics. Bathroom tub and tile sealant. Silicone rubber used for, uh, for lots of stuff. How about this one? The only other example I'm going to show. This is polymethyl methacrylate. or PMMA, Poly Mixed Martial Arts. And this is often called acrylic, uh, plexiglass, but in nanoengineering and chemical engineering, it's also an E-beam or photoresist. An E-beam resist and a, or a photoresist are thin films of polymers that allow you to pattern structures on a silicon wafer. So PMMA and various formulations are used in the semiconductor manufacturing <coughs> industry. What you do is you shine light through a mask through the PMMA film or other photoresist film, and where you expose it, it becomes soluble. Then you wash out the solubilized areas, and then you do, um, you do ion implantation or, uh, or metal deposition into the holes in the photoresist or E-beam resist film. Um, so E-beam, uh, its use is an, e so E-beam, uh, an E-beam process is a slow serial process, but it's the way you generate nanoscale information for the first time. So you make a mask using E-beam lithography. Then you take that mask and then you go to, uh, to the uh, photoresist stepper or the photolithography stepper. You shine light through it and project the image onto a, to a wafer. So this takes maybe a day to make a mask, but these you can make many hundreds or thousands per day. Okay, the sizes of these polymers are determined by the molecular weight. Now, unlike a small molecule, a polymer can exist in a range of molecular weights and you can characterize it in a few different ways. So the first, uh, the first way is the Oh, they fixed this blackboard finally. You have no idea what that does for my quality of life. <laughs> the number average, this is the conventional, uh, conventional average. No, I spoke too soon. So the, uh, the number average molecular weight is the conventional average. So you just take all the molecules, you add up uh, all the weight, then you divide by the number of molecules in the system. It's like the average weight of, um, of sacks of flour in a box. And we call it MN, which is the summation over I of N sub I times M sub I over the summation over the I's of N sub I's, where I is the degree of polymerization. 
So a monomer would be one, dimer two, trimer three, and so forth. N is the number of molecules with degree of polymerization of I. And M sub I is the weight of molecule, the weight of one molecule with degree of polymerization I. Now the conventional average is not always that useful in practical in a practical sense because suppose you have a molecule with a molecular weight of a million and then you have a bunch of molecules with a molecular weight of 10. Say the polymerization process didn't go very well. 10 is probably a too, too low a number because there aren't that many monomers that would have a degree of or molecular weight of 10, say 50. A million and a bunch of little 50s swimming around. Now the mechanical properties and the thermal properties are gonna be dominated by this one molecule with a molecular weight of a million. But the average would, be, uh, would give you a much, much lower uh, weight. The conventional average of a bunch of 50s and the, the million would bring the average molecular weight down to something very small if you use the conventional average. But you can use a weight average, which reflects the, uh, the weight of the largest, uh, the, the, the fractions, the polymer molecules which make up the largest uh, weight of the material, the largest absolute weight of the material. And the way you calculate this is MW. equals the sum over i's of w i times m i over sum over the i's of w sub i, where the only different thing here is that w of i is the weight of entire sample with degree of polymerization I. And in the notes online, I have a worked example of two samples of polymer uh, chains where we have, um, we have a sample of 10 chains each. In one pile, we have 10,000, 11,000, 12,000, 13,000, 14,000, all the way up to 20,000. Then in this other, pile, you have 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, and then a bunch of polymers with, uh, with, uh, with a bunch of chains with weights in the 10,000s. And then you calculate the MN and the MW and make sure that you can get the answer that's in the key here, but it's kind of tedious, so I'm not gonna do it out on the board. If you play around with the definitions, uh, MW is always going to be greater than MN, which gives us, and if we divide MW by MN, we get some quantity that's greater than one, and this is called the polydispersity index. PDI, uh, public displays of indifference. And uh, we usually now call this D with a line through it because polydispersity isn't favored by the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry anymore. It's just dispersity. 
because uh, although you'll still see polydispersity in most places uh, still, uh, except for papers that have come out in the last few years. Because if something's disperse already, it doesn't add anything to say it's polydisperse. Okay, in, uh, in your textbook, if you have a polydispersity of one, which is what we're going to assume for most, uh, for most cases with regard to intermolecular and surface forces. So, so if MW equals MN and the polydispersity is, uh, is one, we're just gonna call this M for the rest of the course, but I want you to make sure that you know this. I have no idea why there's a plastic fork up here. There it is. <coughs> Maybe someone was, professor was eating their croutons while talking. Um, this is extraordinarily rare. You have to try really hard to get this, and you can only do it in certain circumstances. Like suppose you made, like, suppose you could do stepwise addition of, of monomers where you, say, hit a button and a protein synthesizer, and you're like, glycine, go, glycine, go, glycine, go. Then you'll have a tenmer, and they'll all be tenmers. And then they would be MW equals MN. Um, but in a real system where you have 10 kilodaltons of something, it's really improbable that your polymerization would go exactly the same speed with every single molecule. That actually leads me to the next uh, topic is polymerization mechanisms. Because we tend to think of polymers as, oh, it's just a polymer. This chair is some, some polymer made of some distribution of molecules and then some other, um, this plastic bottle a polyethylene terephthalate is made of some, some other, you know, similarly distributed com uh, composition of molecules, distribution of molecular weights, but it really depends on how, you, uh, on how you prepare the material. So this is not a chemistry class, but, uh, but I think it will, um, it will be useful to some of you just to know where these materials come from because it affects things like the molecular weight, which will affect the, uh, the things like cohesive energy of Van der Waals solids, polymeric solids, once we have solid objects of, of stuff. So if you haven't seen this before, it's definitely worth knowing. So we have step growth uh, polymerization. Sometimes these are called uh, polycondensations. Say you had an amino acid like glycine, for example and you had N of them, and you got something that looked like this. So you have glycine over here, which is the simplest of the, of the 20 essential amino acids. Um, and suppose you heated this up a lot, you'd probably use some catalyst, but just say you heated it up and draw, drew out all the water as it formed, so you drove the equilibrium to the right, you would generate this uh, polymer called polyglycine, and you would condense a molecule of, uh, of water um, out of it. Now, looking at this reaction, why, uh, why would it be step growth? Because the next molecule doesn't necessarily just add to the growing chain, 
you always have these unreacted chain ends on either side of the molecule. And then monomers, more monomers could add on either end of the molecule. Or you could have two polymers that attach to each other. So if you have two polymers that attach to each other, then you have what's called step growth. So you, you might have a tumor attached to a tumor to make a, it's not a tumor, a tumor attached to a, to a tumor, to a former, to an eightmer, to a 16mer, and so on. So you get these steps in growth. It's like having a penny and doubling it every day. In a month, you'll be a millionaire. But on the 29th of the month, you won't have much money at all. On the 25th of the month, you won't have much money at all. It takes those last few doublings to get significant molecular weight. So if you, if you, plot, the, if you plot the degree of polymerization, the average degree of polymerization, as a function of reactive groups consumed, it looks like this. And then at the very end, you finally get uh, you finally get good, um, uh, high degrees of polymerization. This is in contrast to situations in which the end of the polymer chain is the only reactive part of the system, and it's only reactive toward other monomers. So you can't have chains attaching to chains. You, you can, but don't worry about that. You, can, you can't have chains attaching to chains in general. Um, and you get, you get a profile that instead looks like this. So what's an example of that? Well, polystyrene, poly, uh, poly, uh, polyethylene are made in um, ways that resemble uh, chain growth. So this is called chain growth. This, uh, this bit with the, with the profile that looks like this, forget I said that for now, uh, because that's only true if all the chains start and grow at the same rate, which is not guaranteed. So a radical uh, polymerization. A radical is an unpaired electron. Which is very reactive, which is why you don't want radicals in your bloodstream because they'll react with, with anything and they'll damage uh, tissue and DNA and so on. Okay, so imagine that we have don't worry about the mechanism. I'm just going to show it for those of you who, uh, who are interested. So what we have is this, um, this initiation step. Then we have a propagation step. Because if we have an unpaired electron, um, we, uh, we get formation of a new bond here. Unpaired electrons like these double bonds, so you get a new bond here. Then the unpaired electron needs somewhere to go, so it goes to the end of the chain, and then it reacts with another monomer. This monomer, by the way, is called styrene. So polystyrene is what we are making. And so then we get propagation of the chain thusly. Finally, to generate polystyrene or PS. Polystyrene is ubiquitous. There's probably tons of things that are polystyrene in this, uh, in this room uh, right now. Styrofoam, petri dishes, everything. Lots of stuff. Not everything. Lots of stuff is like this. Now, if the radical polymerization is just allowed to 
proceed at its own rate. Uh, you have, you'll have little bits of the reaction mixture where the, poly, the polystyrene will polymerize here, like pop, and then it will all polymerize, then, then that whole chain will polymerize, then maybe somewhere else in the flask or the reactor will polymerize, then somewhere else it'll polymerize. And as a result, as a result if, you take a, uh, if you take a snapshot of the reaction at any time before all the monomers are consumed, you'll have fully formed chains and unreacted monomers. That's the only thing you'll have in the mixture. Now, the other way of doing this is a controlled radical uh, polymerization, which allows you to start all of the chain growths at the same time. And this is a really active area of research to make, um, to make new uh, engineering plastics and materials for, uh, for biological integration. This is called controlled, and also for the microelectronics industry, uh, controlled radical uh, polymerization, and this is called C. RP. CRP is not the only way to do a controlled uh, chain growth polymerization. There are also anionic methods of doing this. Uh, and, and if you're interested in this topic, you can take my class Nano Senge 134 in the spring, and I'll go through this uh, in much more detail. Um, so we call this a controlled radical polymerization, and it's uh, living. So what does it mean? What do we mean by a living? A living polymerization is one in which the uh, the polymer chain doesn't get uh, is is still alive. It's still alive, and and if it if the reaction stops and you add because you're out of monomers and you add more monomers in, the polymer chains will continue to grow. So it's alive. And how do we do that? One of the first methods that was discovered was to take this species called Tempo, which is this nitroxide group here. And the nitroxide group has a very, uh, is, it forms a stable radical. So what this does is pops on and off and the electrons go to, uh, to either side. With some kinetic rate constant of K dissociation and K association. The K association, it's more often in the associated state than in the dissociated state. So Tempo, this is a commercially available uh, uh, molecule, and it's stable as a radical. As far as radicals go, it's stable. And then you get the, uh, the styrene um, radical, which, to which you can add additional styrene monomers to give you polystyrene. Okay, now what is the advantage of this? Since we mostly favor this form, it's mostly dormant. And this is the reactive form. So we're mostly, most of the time we're in the dormant, the dormant form. Only sometimes we're in the reactive form. In the reactive form is the only time that we can add in other monomers. So if it's mostly dormant, occasionally reactive, we get a small handful of monomers at each time, uh, time period. Then what we're going to have is all of the chains are pretty much going to grow at the same time and at the same rate, which is what you want for a controlled process. Often, you don't care. And you just throw in the radical initiator, let it go, close your eyes, and then some amount of time later you have a vat full of the polymer that you want. But that doesn't give you the best control over, uh, over 
molecular weight and therefore physical properties. It's also impossible or very difficult to do things like attaching <coughs> polymers to cells, to attaching polymers to surfaces, um, making drug delivery nanoparticles, that kind of thing. So that's why controlled radical polymerization is such a useful technique and why one of these days it will probably win the Nobel Prize, but it hasn't, uh, it hasn't yet. So, uh, so just as a, as a summary, if you plot generic molecular weight versus percent conversion, of end groups, you have something like this for step growth, and you have something like this for controlled radical polymerization or any other living uh, mechanism. How are, uh, how are polymers, how is the molecular weight uh, of a polymer determined? By far the most common way to do this in a lab is through something called uh, gel permeation. or size exclusion chromatography and basically what you have is some column that's full of some matrix. And the matrix has pores in it. So we have this porous matrix which slows down uh, it's it slow it ac actually slows down the smaller particles this is a a bead so it's a porous matrix, it slows down smaller particles, uh, the larger particles it's just, they simply go around the beads. They just go, oh, oh, I'm done. Whereas the smaller particles will find the first one and they'll say, oh, maybe I'll go in here, and maybe in here, and then maybe in here. So the larger ones go, uh, go around the beads and elute first. So as you run this chromatograph, the larger particles come out first, larger polymer chains come out first. And if you have a system of standard uh, sizes, so you have this, um, this collection of, uh, of polymers that were de whose molecular weights were determined by a, a more accurate but more tedious method, uh, then you can send in your standards first, then you send in, so you can, you, can, uh, you can calibrate the time it takes for the polymer to come out versus its molecular weight, then you could add in your unknown 
and then if you then then you know that a certain retention time correlates to a certain molecular weight. Um, on the order of a few nanometers to a few hundred nanometers. Wait, the, the whole tube? Or? Oh, the whole tube can be as big as you want. It could be a few millimeter, like a millimeter in diameter, um, or it could be, you could have like, so for, for example, for a, a GPC or SEC system that you have in the lab, Usually the tube is like a the stainless steel column on the outside and it's packed with some stationary matrix and the actual active diameter is on the millimeter scale. Because um, you don't usually use a whole ton of sample. Um, but for a, a, what's called a preparative GPC, a prep GPC, you might have a larger diameter. Uh, for an industrial process, you could have a much larger diameter than that. Um, it's very similar to column chromatography in uh, organic synthesis, for example, except the separation mechanism is totally different. Yeah? Uh, typically pressurized and lots of atmospheres. Um, I don't know what the number is off the top of my head, but uh, many atmospheres. Okay, just a little bit more about the types of, um, of polymer nomenclature you'd likely encounter. And this is just a taste of this field, just to make you dangerous, just enough to make you dangerous. There's such a thing as uh, tacticity of, for example, polystyrene, which is an example of something called a polyolefin. Polyolefin just means that the backbone looks like this and every other carbon atom has some stuff on it. That's a polyolefin. This is atactic, what have we drawn here? If we draw the polyolefin chain in the plane of the board, then these, what are called substituents, can either be pointing out of the plane of the board or into the plane of the board. If, it, if, if it's random or we don't care, then we write uh, a straight line. And if, we, if it's random or we don't care, we call it atactic. If it's non-random and they're all in the same direction, Then we draw these wedges to indicate that they're coming out of the plane of the board. Then this is called isotactic. And if it's non-random and it's alternating, then it's called syndiotactic. Atactic materials are always amorphous. And isotactic and syndiotactic are usually semi-crystalline. So to get crystalline behavior, you need to have order in the backbone, or you need to have order in the structure. Atactic, since it's random, is totally uh, amorphous. Uh, polypropylene, like polypropylene where X is just a methyl group, 
is like what carpet um, carpet is generally made of isotactic polypropylene. Um, atactic polypropylene is kind of a useless material. It's kind of it's kind of gummy. Um, atactic polystyrene is like a petri dish or the uh, or the body of a tic tac container, whereas polypropylene is the top of a tic tac container. Um, Isotactic polystyrene is not used industrially. Syndiotactic polystyrene is starting to come out as an engineering plastic. For those of you keeping score at home. A solid sample of a polymer. Can look like a lot of different things, but we're just going to draw it. Um, we're just going to draw it in a very simplified, cartoonish manner here. We have crystalline domains. And crystalline domains are characterized by a melting temperature. So you add enough uh, heat and you get, a, uh, you get an endothermic signal in a calorimetry experiment that corresponds to, uh, to, the, to the crystallites melting. And then in between the crystallites, you have these regions where the polymer chains haven't quite lined up with each other. And these are the amorphous domains And they are characterized by something called the glass transition temperature. Glass transition temperature is a little bit like the melting temperature, but it's not quite. It's not a. It's not a pure. It's not a. Um, uh, it's not a first order phase transition that has a that has an associated latent heat and all that thermodynamic uh, stuff. The Tg is really the uh, the temperature at which you've added enough activation energy into the system to allow uh, chains that are initially amorphous and frozen to have enough energy to start sliding past each other. If you have a, so I mentioned, for example, that a Petri dish is atactic. So if a Petri dish is atactic, anyone ever put a Petri dish into the oven at uh, like 105 degrees Celsius? and it melts. I mean, of course, you're not supposed to, so most people haven't, but, um, but, it, but it melts. It doesn't really melt. Really what you're doing is raising it above the Tg, because if it's atactic, it doesn't have any crystalline domains in it, and therefore there's no melting temperature. You just have the glass transition temperature, which is enough to turn it into this viscoelastic liquid. Yep. Is a glass molding based on the same principle? Glass molding is in silicon dioxide glass. So like glass glass, like an inorganic glass also has a TG. But polymer science is really the only area of material science, well, it's one of the areas of material science where we really care about the difference between TM and TG. Uh, polymer conformation depends on, depends on stiffness of the chain. So this is flexible. <coughs> uh, 
where this is stiff. Now, how does that, uh, how does that affect, uh, affect things, or how do we quantify this? By something called the contour length. The contour length is just the length of the chain, regardless of how stiff it is. Is the length of the chain stretched out. And it is n times l, where n is the degree of polymerization. I had called it i before in the summation because we're used to seeing i's in summa summations. If I called it i here, it would look like an imaginary number, which it is most certainly not. So for in the, in the book and, and for, uh, for these calculations, n will be the degree of polymerization, the number of links in the chain. And l is the length per, per unit. So degree of polymerization, like 1, is monomer, 2, dimer, three, trimer, and so on. Another thing that we, uh, we won't calculate it, but you should know what it is, is something called LP, the persistence length. And the persistence, persistence length is the length at which correlation is lost. What do I mean by correlation? So a bond, a chemical bond, can only really point in a few different directions. It generally can't fold completely back on itself, right? We never have polymer, we never have bonds that are 180 uh, degrees, right? Bonds that are like this and fold over on themselves. So they have some, some restriction. Now if you have enough, if you have one monomer attached to another monomer, you can say with some certainty that it'll still be pointed generally in the same direction as the first as the bond between the first monomer and the second, the next bond will be within some range of pointing in the same direction as the first. Now, if you add up enough of these, you might have a bond pointing in God knows what direction. Now, the length at which the, the nth bond is correlated to, the, the length at which the, uh, the correlation between the nth bond and the first bond is lost is called the, is called the persistence length. So for example, um, a completely stiff polymer, the contour length and the persistence length will be the same. A polymer that was completely like a, like a chain that had, uh, that had completely free rotation your persistence length would be, uh, would be very short, uh, probably like one unit. Okay. Yeah. Is this related to radius of variation? Uh, that's the next topic, yep. So in a freely jointed chain, like a necklace, we have a random coil. This discussion, by the way, is in your book. 
So this is where we start, started in Israeli Shvili. So we have a random coil with a center of mass. And the polymer chain is characterized by some radius. This is a, called a random coil. And the center, uh, the, the characteristic radius of this uh, random coil is called RG, the radius of gyration. which is defined, you don't have to calculate it, but it's defined as the RMS, root mean squared distance, from the uh, from center of mass to each monomer. So it's not from the center of mass all the way to the edge of the, the cloud. It's some intermediate distance that is the average of the center of mass to each of the monomers in the polymer chain. And we get this by multiplying the length per unit times the square root of the degree of polymerization over square root of 6. And just to give you an idea, suppose you had, so if n is um, the total weight divided by the The degree of polymerization is the total uh, weight of the chain divided by the weight of the monomer to give you the number of units. And suppose some typical value was, uh, was a molecular weight of a million divided by a monomer molecular weight of 200. And suppose the length of each unit was one nanometer. So one nanometer times square root of 10 to the 6 over 200 divided by square root of 6 gives you 29 nanometers for a radius of gyration of a freely jointed chain. Now polymers generally aren't free, freely jointed chains. Usually there is some restriction. There's always some restriction. So it's going to be a little bit bigger than that. How about so this polymer blob, there's a lot of solvent and stuff in there. Imagine this is like a protein. There's going to be, a, there's going to be it's going to be interspersed with, with solvent, like water. So the volume of the polymer chain is actually only a small fraction of the total volume. So let's, uh, let's do some, some engineering Sith powers here and approximate each polymer, uh, mo each monomer as a cylinder. So if, if each segment is cylindrical, with diameter L, let's say it's a unit cylinder, so it's just as long as it is, uh, as it is diatomatrous, not a word. 
Then we have a radius of L equals 2, length of L, and a diameter of L. Then the actual volume of the, of the polymer chain will be pi over L over 2 squared times L uh, N, which is just the volume of a cylinder times the number of cylinders, or something close to N times L cubed. But the gyration volume is something different. So if we take kind of this big volumetric footprint, this big space occupied by this blob, we get the volume of a sphere with radius rg, so 4 thirds pi rg cubed. And this goes as 0. 3 times L cubed N to the 3 halves. And the uh, take home from this is if N equals 1,000, so we have 1,000 mer, only 10% of the gyration volume is actually occupied. The rest is solvent. And the solvent, based on its intermolecular forces, ah, it took 58 minutes, but we got two intermolecular forces. Solvent, based on its intermolecular forces, will allow this gyration volume to either expand or contract, depending on how favorable the interactions are of the solvent with the monomers in the polymer chain. So this, this argument, is valid in in an ideal solvent with no intersegment interactions in a real solvent have something called the Flory radius times alpha Rg. This is the Flory radius named after Professor Radius. And alpha is the intramolecular expansion factor. And in what's called a good solvent, alpha is greater than 1, and the coil expands. And in a poor solvent. Alpha is less than 1. The coil shrinks. But a bad solvent can be made good by increasing the temperature. at 
that T equals something called T theta, the theta temperature. Alpha equals 1, and the Flory radius equals the gyration uh, radius. And by extension, in a theta solvent, in a theta solvent, RF equals RG, so we can ignore solvent interactions. And it can be treated as invisible. The solvent can be treated as invisible to the polymer's, uh, the polymer's radius of gyration. Does it mean that it's actually invisible? No, it means that the push-pull between solvent-polymer solvent interactions and polymer-polymer polymer interactions <laughs> balances out so that, on average, you get a, uh, you get a, a polymer uh, blob that, uh, that behaves as though there was no solvent, um, uh, no solvent present and no intermolecular interactions. Okay, so polymers adsorb to surfaces. and create repulsive forces between surfaces in contact. And we can bond polymer chains to surfaces in a few different ways. Absorption can have a few different options here. So in the far left and the far right example, I've shown this dot here, which means chemisorption. It means there's an actual sharing of electrons, a covalent bond between the polymer and the surface. This is chemisorption. These two are fizzysorbed. which means only by intermolecular forces are they bound to the surface. This one is also chemisorbed. These two you can think of as being in a theta solvent. This one, compared to the theta solvent, looks like it's in a good solvent. This polymer, where the spacing between the polymers is much smaller than the length of the polymer, is called the brush regime. And these polymers stuck to a surface in a way reminiscent of mushrooms to a log is, wait for it, known as the mushroom regime. <laughs> mushroom regime, of course, ruled by King Koopa and the Koopa Troopas. <laughs> the, 
the, this refers only to the polymer brush. I think. Yeah, for the polymer brush, we have, we have a thickness L. which is going to be greater than the radius of gyration or the flurry radius of one of these polymers that was just allowed to freely swim about in a solvent. So these polymers are used as protectives against flocculation when D is less than, so D again, the distance between two surfaces is less than a few RGs or R Fs. Let's look at the two regimes, the mushroom regime first and then the brush regime second. So in the, so let's look at two surfaces separated by D. And we have these mushrooms. And a mushroom is characterized by S, the mean distance between them. So mean separation. And You'll also see this hangman symbol, which I think is a capital gamma, which is equal to one over S squared, which is equal to the number of chains, average number of chains per unit area. So this is the mushroom regime, low coverage, Mushroom regime is, is, uh, is generally low coverage. Where S is greater than the radius of gyration and you get a repulsive pressure equal to 36 gamma KT over the radius of gyration times some exponential decay e to the minus d over rg. And this is in units of Newton per square meter. Now the origin of this force you might think is just due to the steric repulsion of the polymer chains. And that's sort of true, but not it doesn't tell the whole picture. It's really because we're confining the, uh, the gyration of these polymer chains and at some finite temperature T, they're going to occupy as many configurational states as they possibly can. And as a result, if you squeeze them together, you're going to prevent them from being able to explore all possible confir uh, conformational uh, space. So have a reduced number of configurations of where you can put each monomer and therefore you'll get an entropic repulsion. And that's actually the origin of this, uh, of this repulsive pressure. <coughs> One more thing and then I'll let you go. So for a polymer brush, 
on the other hand, And this is valid for separation distances less than about uh, two times the length of the brush. You have a repulsive pressure given by the Alexander equation which is PD equals KT over S cubed times the quantity 2L over d to the 9 fourths minus d over 2l to the 3 quarters, also in units of pressure or newtons uh, per square meter. The positive term represents, if you do the derivation, which we're not going to, and I've never done it, so you don't have to is due to the osmotic repulsion between coils and this term is the the elastic stretch energy between chains, which favors attraction. One other identity that's good to know uh, is that in a good solvent, L is equal to N little l to the 5 thirds over s to the 2 thirds. There is a problem on your, uh, on your homework that will allow you to work with the, uh, to work with these equations. Really, I just want you to know where it comes from conceptually and how you might use it. Um, in the next few classes. We're really approaching the home stretch in, uh, in this class. In the next class, we're going to talk in a little bit more detail about surface tension, uh, capillary forces, something called the Laplace pressure, which determines the pressure on bubbles and droplets and why they assume their uh, spheroidal uh, shapes in solution, capillary rise in trees, and wicking in paper and other, uh, other uh, surfaces that use surface tension. Um, we'll talk about friction and adhesion um, on Tuesday's lecture next week, uh, and a little bit on self-assembly, and then we have special topics. Uh, then we have the exam, then we have special topics until the final. So uh, thank you very much for your attention, and I'll see you on Thursday. Is that